klutz. You know what klutz is? Okay, you know, schlepper, klutz. And one day, lo and behold, he wins the lottery. And the whole shtetl comes together to congratulate him. And said, Yankel, how did you win the lottery? How did you win the lottery? He says, listen, you need to have seichel, abyssal seichel, and abyssal mazel. He says, tell us more. Well, my mother always told me that the number seven is a lucky number. So I figured seven times seven, I put down the number 48, and I won. <laughs> so, so they tell him, Yankel, seven times seven is 49. He says, I told you, you need to have also Bissel Mazel. <laughs> so today's class is Stars and Signs, the world of astrology, and what does Torah have to say about this big topic? And um, we're going to start right away with um, the question, what do you think Judaism stands on astrology is and why? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you, I'm not gonna let you answer the question, but that's kind of the question, right? Um, and we're gonna start right away with the video that give us some fascinating insight into the world of astrology based on Torah. You will be in for a treat. Listen to this. What is Judaism's position on astrology? To answer that, a little intro is in order. Astrology is the belief that each celestial item that makes up the furniture of our skies has a direct influence one way or another on planet Earth and its human population. Now, there's a lot going on up there, but as far as astrology is concerned, we can group it all into two categories. Of all the countless stars, astrologers are fascinated by 12 specific clusters or constellations. If we draw imaginary lines in the sky, like a child drawing dot to dot, these clusters turn into simplified images. Why are these clusters meaningful to astrologers? Because they belong to a region of the sky that is directly in the path that the sun takes during the course of a year. If we imagine the sun to be a giant pointer, it draws attention to a different constellation each month. So nature itself appears to highlight the importance of specific clusters at specific times. Astrology refers to the constellations as zodiac signs, and the region of sky they occupy as the zodiac belt. Beside the stars, which occupy fixed positions, there are also celestial bodies that move through our skies and are said to wield influence. Seven of them are close or bright enough to be visible to the human eye, and were therefore known to the ancients, who treated them as a complete set. Now, the exact positions of the constellations and planets is highly significant to astrology in at least three ways. One, birth. This is a one-time calculation. The astrological reading at the moment of your birth says a lot about your personality and life. Two, events. This is a relationship between the stars and planets and large-scale events on planet Earth. Wars, wealth, tsunamis, famines. Three, activity. This is a way to determine which activities are likely to be successful based on their timing. Certain astrological signs suggest that beginning a specific activity at that time is highly advisable, while to begin other specific actions would be disastrous. So, where does Judaism stand on all this? Well, for a start, Judaism insists that God directs the world. The stars and planets do not. Does that belief sabotage astrology? A look inside Judaism's classic sources reveals conflicting opinions. Some, like the famous Maimonides, insist that the stars and planets are perfect for configuring a precise calendar, but nothing more. Others argue that God created these features of our universe to serve as useful tools. They do have an influence on us to an extent directed by God. Several classic Jewish sources deal with astrology, but today we'll take a look at the Talmud. The Talmudic sages use the Hebrew term mazalot, which means flow or travel because the planets journeyed through our skies. And they discussed three astrological time periods, hours, days, and months. 
The monthly mazalot are the zodiac signs that alternate on a monthly basis. But here's a catch. Jewish months are lunar-based and fit a unique Torah system of astronomical calculations. So don't expect the monthly mazalot to perfectly match the common zodiac system. But the monthly zodiacs are very rarely mentioned in the Talmud, so the rabbis couldn't have considered them overly important. Instead, they paid close attention to the hourly mazalot. How do those work? Divide each day into 12 equal hours and each night into another 12. Each hour of the day and night is influenced by another of the big seven. Begin with the first hour of Saturday night. Put Mercury in that slot. For the second hour, add the moon. The third hour belongs to Saturn, then Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, and the seventh hour is Venus. For the eighth hour, begin the pattern again. In goes Mercury. And we keep up the same pattern all week long. It fits perfectly, so we always start again with Mercury at the first hour of Saturday night. Now, in addition to the planets rotating their rule on an hourly basis, there is also the concept of daily mazalot. For this, we must view the day and the night as two distinct units of time. We then identify one dominant mazel for the 12 daytime hours and another dominant mazel for the 12 night hours. Let's take Tuesday as an example. Which planet dominates the first hour of the day? That would be Mars. So Mars is the major player for that entire 12 hour period, while the others are minor players. But when night falls on Tuesday, Mars steps down from its throne. Which planet takes its place? Saturn sits at the first hour of each Tuesday night. So Saturn becomes the primary influencer throughout that night. That's how the daily mazalot works. But as mentioned earlier, the Talmudic sages focused mainly on the hourly mazalot. For example, if you wanted to discover something about your natural personality, you would identify the precise hour of your birth and take note of its dominant mazal, which lends a whole new meaning to our responding to a birth with mazal tov. <clears throat> Interesting, right? And uh, so we have hourly mazalot, we have daily mazalot, monthly mazalot. Actually, on your chart in your books, you have a beautiful chart that you can look over later. Uh, page 46. So the Talmud is, is filled with different astrological systems. And uh, they put together beautiful mazals. You look over here on page 46, the seven, um, the seven planets, and you have the Rabbi um, Chanina's destiny chart. For example, um, Mars. What is Mars? Based uh, if if you if the when when Mars shines, what is it? Spiller of blood. Mars is in Hebrew is called Madim. Madim comes from the word of dam, which is blood. So there's certain hours of the week that is connected to the, plant, to, to the mazal of Mars. Then you have the monthly mazalot. Of course, everyone knows that one. Actually, what's interesting is that in, uh, there is a custom, some people follow this custom, that Friday night, Friday night, what is Friday night? Look over here in your chart. Friday night between uh, 6 o'clock, which... which uh, which uh, which muzzle is it? Huh? Sun. Look over here. So, uh, Friday. Yeah. What is it? Mars. It's Mars. 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 Between six and seven is Mars, and it says that some people have a custom that they do not make kiddush between the hours of six and seven, because kiddush is wine is also red. And it's not a good omen to make to make uh, drink wine between six and seven on Friday. So this is just an indication that yes, these all these astrological ideas have a very strong uh, source in Talmudic literature. So, but um, does that mean we got to follow these? Um, yes or no? We're gonna get we're gonna get into that right now. So we're gonna start with the story in the Torah. This was in the Talmud. We'll go to the Bible. In the Torah, we have. 
famous story of Moshe, starting with Pharaoh, page 48, right? So right in the beginning of Exodus, we all know the story, coming up with Port Pesach, the Jewish people are enslaved by Pharaoh, and Pharaoh makes a decree that every Jewish boy, look over here, text 1, page 48, Pharaoh gave an order to all his people, every boy that is born must be cast into the Nile, but let every girl live. Why did he decree it? against the boys, not against the girls. <clears throat> so look in text 1b, Rashi says, Pharaoh made this decree on his, own, on his own people as well, not only against the Jews, even his own people. Why? He did so because on the day Moses was born, his astrologers told him, the savior of the Jewish people was born today, but we don't know if this person is a Jew or an Egyptian. We do see, however, that his eventual downfall will be through water. So Pharaoh, therefore, made a decree that, that very day against all newborn boys, including the Egyptian. All right, so we see the Pharaoh's astrologer told him that the Savior will, whoever's going to stand against you, will be punished by water. He was born and punished by water. So he doesn't care if it's going to be an Egyptian or Jew. Let, him, let all the boys, even the Egyptian boys, be drowned in the water. What does Moshe, when Moshe is born, what does his mother do and his sister? They put him in a basket, right? Where? In the Nile River, right? So we have the first Jewish basket case. <laughs> and that's why Jews are always in denial. But the idea is, the moment he was put into the water, the shah says, ah, done. We see he was done, and the power kind of relaxed again. Did they see correctly that this Savior is going to be punished by water? Yes, because Moshe was punished later on. Why? What was his punishment? It's not to go into the land of Israel. Why not? Because he didn't speak to the rock. And God told him to speak to the rock. He hit the rock to get water out. So the Strasher saw something about water, right? So they said, oh, we see that he's going to get punished by water. Okay, so that's what, that was Pharaoh's decree. Um, so, and we have other biblical sources. If you look at next page 50, this is next week, there's no class. You can go through all these texts. We're going to skip most of them. Just for reference, different stories where, like for example, by Abraham, where God told Abraham, you're going to have a child. Abraham looks at the star and says, I'm not destined to have any children, right? He was already 90 years old. And God says, I, I'm in charge of that, and I, I promise you, you'll have a child. And he had a child at the age of 90. By the way, about a week, two weeks ago in Israel, an 80, 80 old rabbi had his first baby son. Yes, first baby son. Second marriage, his wife is 57. Wife 57. Man is never too late. All right. That's always a side note. Look it up. Look it up. His first, what? His first two? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Second marriage, his first. But look at interesting, if we have it, look at the last one, we're just coming off Purim. Look at the last one, it says Haman's Zodiac. You see that? What page is it? It should be full. I don't have your number, huh? 53. See on the last column, Haman's Zodiac. The med we're going to, the, the, we all know that, why is it called Purim? Why is it how called Purim? Because Haman cast a lot when to kill the Jews. He was trying to find what's the best date to kill the Jews. And he came to the month of Adar. So look over here in, a, after the gray box. The Medrash records Haman's calculation as he considered which zodiac sign would be best support his genocidal scheme. Arius the ram favored the Jews because it represented both the month of Passover and the Paschal lamb. Not a good month, right? Taurus too was deemed pro-Jewish due to Joseph's association with the bull and the bull offering in, in the temple. Gemini seemed far too miscreant of King David's auspicious answers, the twins, Peretz, and Zerach. Leo was closely associated with Daniel and the tribe of Judah, which famously called a lion cub. Virgo was likely to recall the merit of, of Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, who refused to forsake their god with total sincerity. Libra recalled Job, Scorpio recalled Ezekiel, Thatcher recalled Joseph, Capricorn recalled Jacob. Everyone is now good, right? So which one? <laughs> Aquarius brought Moses, who drew water from, from, for Yeshua's daughter, to mind. Finally, Haman arrived at Pisces, found no positive omen for the Jews, and rejoiced. But even this backfired, instead of being the fish that swallowed the Jews, 
Haman and himself, himself was swallowed. Right? This is fascinating. This is a, so, huh? The Pisces. Well, Moshe was born in the month of Adar. Right? Month of Adar. It's a fish sign. It says in the month of Adar is a good mazel. This is the best month, by the way. We're in the best month of the mazels. It says month of Adar is the best month that you should have. You should, if you have any uh, simcha, if you have to do a ma wedding, good month to make a wedding. If you have a since we have a business endeavor, good month to close on this month. If you have a court case, try to have it in this month. Um, like fish multiplies, multiplies, and there's a blessing that can multiply. Anyways, all of this is just a, a, a glimpse in the vast ideas of that astrology. It has a very strong point in Jewish literature. But does that mean that we are allowed to live our lives? Should we have dictate our lives by, our, by astrology? So in Jewish belief, and this is very important, um, the Hebrew word for worshipping idols many times is used the word akum. Let me show you on the screen. Akum. Okay? In Hebrew, akum is actually an acronym of four words, which means ovdei, kochavim, umazalot, which translates worshippers of stars and celestial bodies. So worshiping stars, celestial bodies, by definition in, in Jewish law and Torah, is worshiping idols, right? Worshiping idol, which is we're not allowed to worship. You can't worship the, the zodiacs and the stars. Um, and then it's the question is, but do they have any influence on us? So we can say that we don't worship them, fine, but do they have any influence? And how does that work? So if they have any influence on us, by the raise of hands, you believe that Zodiac have any influence on us? Huh? Oh, if you let it, okay. But they have certain powers? Yes. Yes, okay, half and half. Okay, it's the, okay, so the national, the national uh, I think, survey in the beginning, it's kind of like 40% of people believe in the Zodiac stars, right? Some people just curious about it, most, some, and most people don't believe in it. All right. But if you do believe in it, or as we just read, a lot of it, the Torah has, is full of it, right? So how does it work? Do they, if they have an influence, why can I, in a sense, worship them? Worship, worship basically means if I follow, I let them dictate my life, right? A lot of people are very into the charts and they look, they want to see. It's just, just what we're saying. Don't do Kiddush between 6 and 7, right? Not a good, not a good time to make Kiddush. Does that mean they have certain powers over us? By extension, shouldn't that be Odei Kochavim Azolot? You worship the stars, you're living your life based on their energies. And just to, to make the difference is, there's a difference of worshiping a star or to follow, this, to follow the, the energies, what energies they dictate. And when I want to say this too, there's two approaches. One of them is that they, have, they are like natural forces. They're not, they're, not, um, they, they're not gods, they're not idols, they're just natural forces, just like uh, you have, you okay? Ah, that was a natural force of uh, a zodiac just attacked you. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so you have, a, you have, a, you have um, it's just a natural forces, just like fire, right? Consumes anything that comes across. So these, these, these zodiacs, these are, these, are, these are the natural forces that when the time of the day aligns, so the consequence is this is what, this, this, this is what they do. Not that they have any independent um, choices, but this is kind of their, that's kind of their, nat their, nat their, their, natural, their natural ideas, all right? So the heavenly bodies are imbued with, by God with a certain nature, right? Just like fire or water have a certain nature, those heavenly bodies, God imbued them with a certain nature. Um, or the heavenly bodies serve as an indicator of what form of divine expression is dominant. Those who learned in Kabbalah remember that we have the ten sefirot, those ten um, divine attributes. For example, kindness, right? The kindness is, is the right hand. The left hand is what? Strictness. And this, God sometimes um, projects or sends energy of kindness to the world. 
And how does it come via those heavenly uh, bodies? So they're just indicators. They don't have any uh, independent say in the matter. They're not, uh, again, we're not worshiping them. But God sends certain serves as indicators of what form of divine expression is dominant. Now, this hour, this divine expression is dominant over the other. Um, the problem we have with all this is Judaism is very, has, has some very fundamental ideas. Number one, we believe in the concept of freedom of choice, right? So if we accept, or if we, um, even from the biblical and Talmudic teachings, that those zodiacs have certain energy at certain times, even if you say they don't have necessarily uh, a say in the matter, meaning they're just like vehicles that God sends messengers or energies, or their natural bodies, just like fire burns everything. But if this hour, or if I was born, remember we said Mazel Tov, right? The, mo the day you were born, the day when you were born, which by the way is fascinating, and the time that you were born is connected to you, to that moment connected to your Mazel. We said Mazel means consolation. And what do we say? Mazel Tov. I want you to look, we'll skip quick, go quickly to, to text. You can jump quick to text 7 on page 62. We'll come back to the other text. When a woman is giving birth, the people present in the house at the time should pray for mercy for the mother and that the child be born under a positive astro astrological sign. And then we say, Mazel Tov, right? Because we know that the baby is born in that specific Mazel. So we say Mazel Tov, saying like in English, right, it's a congratulations. But really, it's a prayer that what? Mazel Tov. May this moment that they're aligned with the zodiac uh, moment should that be it should be a good muzzle. Tov means good. It should be a good muzzle. So when we say muzzle tov, muzzle tov, right? We should think congratulations. But what we're we saying it should be a good muzzle. As a matter of fact, it is your muzzle. That means you connected to this muzzle, which will, which in a sense, influence so to speak your life, and more so when this is the idea that a birthday is celebrated, not just for children, but we believe that in, in Judaism that we all celebrate a birthday, even as adults, when, actually we go through the Hebrew birthday, because that's where your soul's mazel is, and in your, when you come around the same day in the Hebrew calendar, you realign yourself with this mazel, and when you realign yourself that mazel, that same moment of the year, certain energy can flow, mazel means to flow, that you can tap into that energy. So which makes a birthday a very important day. If you get my uh, card or my email, I'll explain this to you. And if you don't get that a birthday email, let Rabbi Yosef know your birthday. He will set you up with the system. Yeah, every morning I sit and I send out those emails. And if you don't get them. Anyways, well, going back to, um, going back to free choice, right? So I wanna, here's, here's we're gonna we're going to present two opinions, mainly Maimonides. Maimonides, who was an incredible uh, scholar. He lived in, look over here on page 55. He was a, lived 1135 to 1204, right? So about a thousand years ago. <clears throat> this Maimonides was not just a scholar, a Torah scholar. He was also a philosopher. He was, he, he was, he was a crazy author. He wrote an incredible amount of books many that we still have, that we still study. Famously, the Court of Jewish Law, the first Court of Jewish Law, where he organized and wrote out all the Torah's mitzvahs, 630 mitzvahs, in his work, which actually there's a curriculum where we, when you study every day three chapters. If you read three chapters a day of his 14 volumes, you finish it in one year. And by divine providence, today we are concluding that cycle, today. <laughs> So if you want to jump in, tomorrow morning you can start again from the beginning. Look at Chabad.org, goes says daily learning, and there you'll see the daily Maimonides uh, 
uh, study. And if you study, if you study one chapter, it'll take you three years. Three chapter will take you uh, about a year. Um, but you can, if you read through it, you get incredible knowledge of Torah, and it's not that difficult. He was, he had the ability to write things very simple, and he was from the first ones. And after about a, a thousand years post Babylonian exile and Tal Talmud, which you know, Jews when they went to um, Babylonia, they started to speak in Aramaic. The Talmud is not written in Hebrew, it's written in Aramaic. And so the continuous scholars, because this was the language of the Talmud, they always wrote in Aramaic. My mom was the first one who brought Hebrew back to the masses. And he wrote in Hebrew. Uh, he wrote in Hebrew. He also lived in Spain. He lived in, also lived in, in uh, Morocco. He wrote in, he wrote in Arabic. Fascinating. Um, yep. And most importantly, or very famously, he was also a physician. He was a doctor. He was an astrologer, was a doctor. Not just a physician, he was a physician to the Turkish Sultan, to Saladin. And read about, and he writes about a lot about medicine. Fascinating. A lot of the stuff that he writes was he was, he was way ahead of his time. For example, yeah, he's, he's very into having a healthy diet. You've got to sleep eight hours a day. Things that were today, we were like, you know, it's normal. But he wrote this a thousand years ago. Enough about Maimonides. Back on, but he takes a very strong approach as follows. Text 2, page 55. Do not entertain the, the thesis, thesis. <clears throat> held by foolish people. The God decrees at the time of a person creation whether he or she will be righteous or wicked. If God were to decree that an individual will be righteous or wicked or that there will be an instrumentable in, in, inborn quality that compels a person to a particular path of behavior, way of thinking, attributes, or deeds, as the foolish proponents of astrology imagine, how could he command us, do this, do not do this, improve your behavior, or do not fo follow after your wickedness? And according to their mistaken conception, it has already been decreed or predetermined by the person's instrumental nature that he or she must act in a certain way. In addition, so what is he saying? Just don't follow those foolish astrologers to tell you you are basically already predestined, right? Because according to all these uh, ideas of astrology, that means I'm, a wi I'm, I'm wired one way, one way, and that's who I am. But that cannot be according to Torah. Because if then, why, why did God say do this, do that? Why God will punish us for doing something? It's your fault, God. You made me born on Friday between 6 and 7, and I am a bloodthirsty <laughs> murderer. <clears throat> it's interesting. I said somebody's born on that um, on the Mars, and this, the Talmud says he will be he will be what does it say? Bloodthirsty, bloodthirsty, huh? Spiller of blood, spiller of blood. And Talmud says, oh my gosh, that's like a worse thing, right? So the Talmud says it doesn't mean that it's gonna be a spiller of blood. He has a, we're gonna see soon. He can either be a he, either, he has a choice, but he has a tendency towards blood. So either he can be a killer. Or he can be a mohel, or a shochet, or, or a surgeon, or somebody who, who, who does laps, or who, who tells, takes blood. Okay, um, but continue, finish up here. In addition, where, were this to be true, what room would there be for the entire Torah? Uh, what stand of justice would retribution be, be administered to the wicked, or reward granted to the righteous? Shall the judge of the entire world not act justly? So, he had a problem with three things, right? Challenge to astrology. Number one, freedom of choice. How does freedom of choice come to play if we already are pre-wired? So he just says, don't listen to them, right? That's an easy way, Rabbi. Don't listen to them, right? Don't ask questions, right? Judaism doesn't believe in that, by the way, right? We are the only, from the only religions that when we started, first commandment that Moses told the Jewish people, what? To have a Seder, that was who left Egypt, have your children, and they should ask questions, right? Four questions. Manishtana, we encourage to ask questions. Don't say, that's it, don't ask questions. But, okay, so how does freedom of choice come into play? Number two, another important tenet of Judaism is, this, is reward and punishment. You read the 13 pr principles of faith by Maimonides. The 13 principles of faith is that we believe in the idea of reward and punishment, meaning that my actions matter, my action will get rewarded, or punished. But if I am born under a certain energy, 
then how, why, God, how can you expect me to, uh, to, to you know, this is who I am. Okay, you can't punish me. You, you created me this way. Your fault. All right, today's letter, right? My mother's fault. Everyone else's fault. And that's why I'm not going to change and don't punish me. And then that's where you'll be released out of jail the next day and you're all good. All right, so reward and punishment. And number three, not to go too much into that, but there's a, the, another pr fundamental, uh, uh, one of the principles of Judaism is the belief in prophecy. That God speaks to prophets, right? Prophecy by definition means what? To tell them what the future will hold, right? So, so if it's already predetermined in the stars what it's going to be, so where does prophecy fall into this? If the star says one thing, and then prophecy, uh, God prophet, tell, speaks to, to the prophets about something that about this will happen, and they clash, so maybe we shouldn't believe in prophecy. So just to answer the question is, if everything is predetermined, what meaning is there to the Torah's commandment for us? If our destinies are predetermined, what practical weight do our mitzvot and prayer carry? And prophecy, why does God need to send us prophets if the future can be foretold through astrology? Um, so, to answer free choice, the answer is on text 4. We're going to go to text 4, page 57, by Rabbi Sharira Gaon, who lived a little bit before Maimonides. And he writes as follows. Regarding... Astro astrological predictions concerning promiscuity, theft, and, and the like, the celestial body only generates an inclination and desire. Such people feel a strong attraction to theft or promiscuity, but they can restrain themselves and overcome their inclination. This is like the standard negative inclination that we all deal with, sometimes it entices us strongly, but we can, we, we can overpower it. The celestial body can only cause an attraction, increasing the strength of the negative inclination. God has given such people the, requ the requisite strength to overpower this inclination. And people who must struggle mightily to overcome their negative inclination as a result of astrological circumstances are granted greater reward by God for doing so than people who do not feel strongly tempted. So basically, he answers, yes. So how do we bring these two things together? Yes, people that have tendencies or have a more temptation to certain things, that doesn't mean that this is an excuse to follow on those temptations. God has given you freedom of choice that you can overpower those inclinations. Right, to answer freedom of choice. And more so that if you uh, overcome it, the reward will be greater than somebody who doesn't have temptations and overcomes it. And even more so, we believe that if somebody has a certain temptation for something, and that's part of freedom of choice, equally God has given you within you the power to overcome it. So the greater the inclination, the greater the desire, the more strength has God has given you within you, the potential to overcome it. And you make the choice. So when you make the choice, so yes, could be that maybe I'm inclination of a murderer, right? Because I'm born in Mars. But if I say, you know what? And like more passion and I could be in more, have more ang anger inside. That's by this, my zodiac. But if I have the same strength to take that energy and rechannel it, Instead of uh, killing people, um, I love people with a passion, and I will just give them a bris. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that means that I, I, the whole Judaism is all about what? Controlling, right? Mind controls the heart to control your tendencies. So that will answer the reward and punishment question. Um, yes. Good, we're gonna get there, we're gonna get there. Very good, yep. Um, and and, and um, we'll get some also about prophecy, we're gonna answer the prophecy part, but we answered freedom of choice, right? So astrology cannot determine actions, only inclinations, right? 
So then also the question is, so should I go and research what is my, what is my inclinations, right? So let me look into stars and I have a better reading of myself. Is that a good thing or not a good thing? We're going to get to that as well. But remember that they do not have, they cannot determine actions. They can only, only inclinations. Reward and punishment is prayer and, okay, we're going to get to this, the, the next text before we get to this. Um, text five is a very famous story of Rabbi Akiva, right? Before we get to the text, till now we spoke about that, um, Inclinations, right? So, okay, so that stars have, they, they, but how do they affect us by inclination? How about predetermination? Do the stars have the power to predetermine my destiny, my, my future? Yes or no? In other words, if you can say, okay, fine, there's, there's one thing about me having inclinations about being, uh, you know, Mars or this or that, and I can control myself, one thing. But if in the stars it says that this and this will happen to me, or this and this will happen to that, this and this will happen to, you know, to this part of the world, our world, is that, is that true? And if that is true, how does that go, again, with punishment and reward? So if we're all doomed, so what's my point? God, what do you want from me? It's already a bad day today, right? Everything's bad. I'm going to make bad, and people are going to make bad, so forget about it. So... Well, how does reward and punishment come in, and how does and do can we change that? Can we change that? So last week we said a very important line, right? That Judaism does not believe that destiny was chosen for you. Rather, you choose your destiny. You are in charge of your destiny, and how so? By your actions, by your connection, by your prayer through mitzvot and and prayer. Now, yes, because we're going to get this, we're going to, we're going to kind of slide this in also at the end, but you brought it up. Because more powerful than anything, more powerful than all the stars and all those uh, zodiacs is what? Is you. Why you? Because you were created in God's image. And the creator of all has the power, supersedes all of that. So if we connect to our divinely image, that we live our lives by our neshama, nothing has power over you. If, however, you choose to follow or kind of worship those stars, then you are kind of trapping, you're, kind of, you're, pull, you're pulling yourself into that energy where you have the power to completely surpass that. We see this story, famous story, of Rabbi Akiva. I'll get to the story. So Rabbi Akiva has a daughter who's getting married. And look over here in the Talmud, text 5a. Rabbi Akiva has a daughter, a, um, an astrologer told him that she would be bitten by a snake on her wedding day and die. Rabbi Akiva was very worried about this. On the young lady's wedding day, by the way, <laughs> if he's worried about it, why didn't he cancel the wedding? <laughs> That's a wedding. Huh? <laughs> okay, so I don't know how worried he was really, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so on the, young, on the young lady's wedding day, she took the ornamental pin from her hair and stuck it into a hole into the wall for safekeeping. When she did so, it lodged into the eye of a snake, killing it without her knowing that. In the morning, when she pulled the pin out of the wall, the dead snake followed attached to the pin. Rabbi Akiva asked his daughter, what did you do to merit this? She told him, in the afternoon, a pauper knocked on the door, but everyone was preoccupied with the wedding feast, and nobody heard him. I stood up, took my portion of food, and gave it to him. Rabbi Akiva said to her, you performed the mitzvah, and you were saved in its merit. Rabbi Kiva went out and taught regarding this incident. Tzedakah, charity, will save from death. So, in the story, we see that, first of all, we see the validity of, ast of astrology, right? Of indication, because he was concerned about 
it actually almost happened that that snake, that poison snake came to kill her, but she changed the destiny. How so? By the performance of tzedakah, of doing the mitzvah, right? So this is the power of Ashi says in text 5b, through prayer and, and meritorious acts, one astrological destiny can be changed. And there's another uh, verse, I didn't bring in this, in this text, that says as follows, Ein mazal le-Yisrael. There is no mazal to the Jewish people. What does that mean? <laughs> they don't have mazal? Uh, okay, maybe sometimes we don't have no mazal. Ein mazal Yisrael means that the Jewish people, by definition, by, by, by extension, every human being, but when we're talking about the Talmud, talking about the Jews, has the power, Ein mazal, to transcend the muzzle. We are not bound by the muzzle. If we connect to something, a higher power, we have ability to break that. And this will answer also the idea of prophecy. Following? Prophecy. We said, why do we need prophecy? Let's first uh, do the slide. Prayer and Eritrean's conduct can override an astrological destiny. In prophecy, um, let's go back to the story of Pharaoh, right? Did the astrologers give them uh, the right indication? Was it, huh? Yeah, they saw that what? That Moshe is going, that the, Jew, that the Savior is going to get uh, um, punished via water. However, they didn't, they, they, they didn't have a clear idea what it was. They didn't know if it was a Jew, it wasn't a Jew, right? How with water, when with water? So astrology can be extremely blurred, can't really know exactly. So prophecy comes in and gives the clear picture. God will give a clear picture of A, what will happen, or God can surpass, of course, um, the, the, because we said it's not a final destination. Astrology is not the final thing. God can surpass it, so he communicates through prophecy. So astrology is not an exact science and can be relied upon to provide an accurate picture. All right. Um, clear till here? All right. No one's sleeping yet? No one dreaming? Uh huh? Just stop. Reminds me of this lady who, um, this lady who, um, she's, She's 60 years old. Young. Young, sorry. I'm done. I'm done. Today my zodiac is not shining. But... <laughs> so she wants to have a facelift. So she, goes to her, she goes to her plastic surgeon and says, I want to look younger. And he says, well, I can make you 30 years. I can make you 30 years look younger. Wow. Yes? Huh? Want his number? You want his number? Good. So, all right, how much does it cost? So she, he says $30,000. She's like, oh, wow, that's a lot of money. I have to think about it. She goes home, and she uh, says, she turns to God, says, God, I need one answer. How many more years do I going to live? And sure enough, she hears a voice. God says, you're going to live for 30 more years. She says, well, okay. 30 more years, it's a good investment. $1,000 a year, I'm going to love you. Yeah, that's a good investment. She calls, makes the appointment for the surgery. She goes to the surgery. She comes out of the surgery looking 30 years younger. She drives home, and then into this intersection, crash. And she dies on the spot. And she comes up to heaven and says, God, you told me 30 more years. And God looks and says, oh, yeah, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> All right. So. I, but so just to tie in the show, astrology can say this and this will happen to you. But if you do the mitzvah and you do prayers, Hashem says, "I'm not recognizing. It's a new you. It's somebody else. It's not. That's not your destiny." All right. Um, now Maimonides, of all, is very against people even snooping in astrology. He was very against it. He was a so look in text 8 from Maimonides, who wrote a, he wrote a letter. It's one of the letters he wrote to the sages of Montpellier, right? 
Um, and he writes as follows. All philosophers consider everything the astrologers say to be false. I know that you may search in the teachings of our true sages in the Talmud, Mishnah, and Midrashim and find teachings that appear to state that astrological configurations at the time of a person's birth determine certain matters. Don't be bothered by this. One doesn't depart from the settled law in favor of preliminary discussions. Similarly, one should not reject logical conclusions that have already been conclusively proven and instead latch onto the teaching of an individual sage. It is possible that you are misunderstanding something there may be a hidden meaning to this teaching, or it may be, have been stated in response to a specific need for contemporary event. So, he basically says, so what? Astrology has no validity whatsoever. And the Talmudic passages that we just mentioned, some of them indicating otherwise reflect the opinion of individual sages only. It's not the real majority opinion. And those Talmudic passages may have hidden and non-literal meaning. And those Talmudic passages may have been taught for external lessons. So practicing, because of practicing astrology is forbidden according to the Jew, Jew, Jewish law. And he takes a very strong stance on, on text 9 in his laws, in the book of laws. What is the definition on page 64, text 9? What is the definition of fortune telling forbidden by the Torah? This refers to a person who tries to predict auspicious times by means of astrology saying, this day will be a good day, this day will be a bad day. It is appropriate to perform a particular task on a certain day, or this year or this month will not be opportune for this particular matter. So he's not just saying that astrology is foolish, he's just saying that what? It is forbidden to dabble in astrology, it is literally, uh, it's a forbid, one of the 630 commandments, right? You're not allowed to um, if, uh, go to a fortune telling. Oh, good, what does that mean? Okay, we're gonna, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get there slow, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, we're we'll gonna get there, we'll get there. Okay. Um, of course, of course you have, um, you have two Jews, how many opinions? Three opinions, right, huh? And not everybody agrees with my mind is very kind of takes a very extreme approach. And um, in the following text, we're going to look at text six, uh, page 66. And again, this is going to be a homework next week. <laughs> we're not going to read through this, but this is different um, that where you see that astrology and Jewish belief is highly debated. Some of the sages were very, um, very all into it, and some of them very against it. All these different incredible sages, very fascinating to read through this, who they were, where they lived in Europe or in Africa, and how they came to different conclusions. So, question is, as Stray said, should, can I dabble, can I look at to the charts, can I look at the horoscope in the newspaper, right? Should I pursue astrology? That is the question. Um, so, I already gave you the answer in a, in a certain sense. But what? As a, as, a, as a human being, as a Jew created in Hashem's, in God's image, you have the power to transcend all of that. And the Torah says this clearly, and Nachmanides elaborates on this verse in Deuteronomy. So we have Maimonides and Nachmanides. These are all acronyms, by the way. Maimonides in Hebrew is Rambam. His name was, is an acronym from Rabbi Meir ben Maimon, who was a Sephardi, by the way. And it's buried in where? Uh, in uh, he has like three burial sites in Egypt, in, Tunis in, in Tunisia, and uh, Morocco, and, and in, um, in Tiberias, in Israel. Tiberias. Tiberias. Famously in Tiberias, she had the the tomb, the tomb of, we went there, if you look at the, of my Rambam, huh? Yes, of course, of course. Because two Jews, three opinions. Everybody has another synagogue, right? right? Famous joke of a Jew stranded on an island, and then somebody finally finds him after five years. He says, are you the only Jews? Yeah, the only Jews. Show me around. And he sees two synagogues. He says, why do you need two synagogues? He says, 
Well, I built two synagogues. Why? Well, this synagogue I belong to, and this synagogue I do not belong to. <laughs> so, so there is a mitzvah. Yeah. In Morocco. No, Where? In, in Spain. In Spain. In Cordoba. In Cordoba. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah, fat is fat. My mind is a fascinating figure, and we have so much. We have so much of his writing. Um, and there was a, there was, there was also a famous letter he wrote to the people of of um, of um, um, Antioquia. They were forced to convert to Islam, and he has a whole theory about um, that. That that actually is a question because we they don't know life is most important. In Judaism, every mitzvah, uh, we don't we don't have to. We can break a, a mitzvah a commandment. If it's going to take my life, with exception of three, one of them is to is to convert and to worship an idol, and he and he writes clearly that Islam, they will, they believe in a prophet, they don't believe it, they still believe in the same God. So though it should not be done, but if they're forced under coercion, they should they 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 are permitted to do so versus Christianity. Um, but the so it's fascinating. It's read, read, go Google my mind and read his texts and read his books. Um, Famously, he has the book, uh, The Guide of the Perplex, which is a philosophy. All right, so enough of Maimonides. When he wrote, Nachmanides, his name was Nachman. Nachman? Nachman, right? His name was uh, Rabbeinu Nachman ben, um, oh, sorry, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman. Here, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, text 10. He writes as follows. The meaning of the verse be wholehearted with God. Okay, this is four words in Hebrew. Actually, tamim tiye im Hashem alekecha. What does that mean? It's actually one of the mitzvot. What does that mean to be wholehearted with God? Is that we should devote our hearts completely to God and trust that He alone controls everything. We should not inquire from astrologers or any other future tellers. Nor should we trust that the, their predictions will be fulfilled. If we hear any predictions from them. We should assert that everything is in the hands of God because he's om omnipotent and can change the constellations of the heavens at will, negating all the predictions made by astrologers. We should believe that all future occurrences are determined by our service of God. All right? So um, he's saying basically not that there is no validity to astrology, so you're kind of against Maimonides, right? Yes, there is. But as a Jew, you can do much better, right? Concentrate on serving God. If you concentrate on serving God, you're already in good hands. And do not seek astrologers. Do not seek um, what it is. If you read something, by the way, okay, so don't pay too much attention to it because you have the power that you're much stronger than that. That's why in text 11 in Jewish law, it's actually in the Shulchan Aruch, says, we do not make increase from astrologers. Um, in text 12, if we have firm faith in God regarding everything we do, he will transform the astrological destiny from bad to good. And um, so, just to recap, there's a truer, more meaningful way to live life. I'm on serving God, observing his mitzvahs. Astrology is inaccurate and unreliable. God is worthy of our faith. Um, and that is where the power of the mitzvahs come into play. So when you, let's say you do follow, right? You do follow, you do see the chart, and you're very concerned about it. So again, if, what's, what, will be, what, will be the, what will be the response? What should be your response to it? Curiosity, correct. But I'm anxious. I'm still anxious. So yeah, people are all anxious, right? Today is not a good day. This hour is not a good hour. So the answer is, huh? do a prayer and do a mitzvah and, and together trust and faith in God, right? There's faith in God, to believe in God, and there's trust in God. You know the difference between faith and trust? In Hebrew, faith is emunah. Emunah. And trust is bitachon. In Judaism, it's not enough just to believe in God. It is to trust in God. What's the difference? Believe is, in a sense, very, in a sense, very superficial. 
It's just a belief. Trust means that you're actually living by your beliefs. It means you're dictating your life is, 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 is geared and directed what God's will is. Look at the dollar bill. Look at the dollar bill. Exactly, yes. Rabbi always said that. Yes. In God we trust. Listen, in God we believe. In God we trust. Fascinating. All right. Some people, they worship, they worship, worship the dollar bill. A lot of people worship the dollar bill. So it reminds us, and Rabbi spoke about so America is such a beautiful, uh, blessed country that they put this on the dollar bill to remind people not to worship the dollar, but to have trust in Hashem. But the difference really between trust and faith plays out in our day-to-day -day life. Right? Most people have the easy say, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in God. It's like that. But you live your life. So if something happens, some of you get some knowledge, you get some ideas, so some, 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 something happens and you panic. So then the faith is not enough. What, what has to kick in? Your trust. Do you trust God? Like that God knows what, what's going on. That God has the best thing in mind for you. And you can, incur, can live your life or express it how so by doing what he asks you to do. So they asked, Hashem asked me to say the Shema in the morning, to put on tefillin, to put a mezuz on the door, to say a prayer, to give tzedakah. And when we do these things, then again, who, in whose territory are you in? Your territory of God, of the infinite God, of something to, to trans everything. That then there's nothing to fear. The most repetitive word in the whole scripture, whole Tanakh. What are the most repetitive words? In the entire Torah. Do you know that? Huh? No. No. What is the most repetitive words in the entire, not just the five books of Moses, of the entire 24 books of Scripture? Huh? Nope. Uh, you wouldn't hear a poem by the Fabrangan. Nope. Not, not blessing, not truth, not God is one. Al Tira, do not be afraid. Over and over again, do not be afraid. The prophets keep saying to the Jews, al tira, al tira, al tira. But it doesn't mean everything was glue, was beautiful. There was a lot of, a lot of service, right? But as long as you are in Hashem's territory, al tira, it's nothing to fear. So don't be afraid of... All right. So, and actually, the Rebbe in text 13 um, sums it up beautifully in text 13. And he writes as follows. I duly received, on page 71, I duly received your letter in which you asked about the Jewish attitude to horoscopes. Generally, astrology and the like play no part in Jewish life, as also written in the Holy Scriptures. Of the signs in the heaven, you should have no fear. On the contrary, we have the commandment, thou shalt be wholehearted with God your God, which is also quoted in Shulchan Aruch, which is called the Jewish law. This means that the Jew has to have complete and wholehearted faith in God, and his benevolent providence, which extends to each and everyone individually. As for taking an interest in horoscope, purely as a curiosity and the like, as you mentioned. So stop here for a moment. So as a curiosity, technically, if you would follow Jewish law, it's not a problem. You can read the horoscope. It's not a problem, right? Do not follow it. Don't live your life with it. That would be, that's already, uh, if, remember, that's already worshiping idol. If you worship it, if you live your life just by that, but the Rebbe says, don't even, don't even waste your time with that. This would be amount to a waste of interest which should be channeled in a more productive way. And I want to stop you for a moment. If you know anything about the life of the Rebbe, and, and we're going to have a course about the Rebbe's teaching in the summer, the Rebbe was extremely careful with his time. That every moment is precious. And not just that was that's a Jewish uh, idea. That every moment is there's a purpose, a mission why we're here. Every moment is sacred. And the Rebbe tried never to waste a, a moment himself. Once he, uh, once he, in the fifties, he 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 traveled to the Catskills to visit a Jewish day camp, a Jewish overnight camp, and they had a and they had a flat tire. So it took fifty minutes to change the flat tire. He told his assistant, I'm, I have a hard time figuring out how one can regain those 15 minutes that, that were wasted. Uh, okay, we're not on that, that level. But maybe seeing like this, tell, he's encouraging this individual, he's writing this letter. Huh? Yeah, today you have a phone, you can call somebody, you're sitting, sitting on, the, on the side of a highway in 1950, it was very hot. Yes, 
Yeah, today, absolutely. Okay, so for it's explained in Hasidus that God has not given man an, ex an excess of capacities, nor a deficiency of it. In other words, every person, and especially a Jew, has been given a certain amount of capacities and powers of concentration, etc., all of which must be utilized in the fulfillment of his purpose in life on this earth, namely to live in accordance with the Torah and the mitzvot, and to disseminate justice and righteousness, etc. Everyone has their mission. Remember in the Kabbalah class, right? What is your mission? Everyone has their mission and purpose. And everybody has a certain amount of energy they can focus, utilize for the mission. And energy also needs concentration. Concentration. And it follows from the above that if a person should divert any of his capacities, thought and concentration on a useless thing, even, it be, even if it be harmless, is nevertheless harmful in the sense that he would thereby create a deficiency in the area which is important and necessary for him. Um, so he doesn't say it's forbidden, he just says, why waste your time with something when it will take away concentration from other things that you can be productive in the service of your mission and purpose with, with Torah mitzvahs. Um, so, Faith in God and observance of mitzvah releases from natural this destiny. All right. Uh, so the Rebbe's guidance: engaging horoscope is a distraction from where our minds should be focused. Um, but I want to finish with this part, another one last part, and that is um, determinism, the new astrology. So today, although you have maybe sixty percent of people who do not believe in astrology, but there's a new type of uh, uh, astrology which is determinism, which is based on your genes, psychology, right? Today, we can look at your genes and it can already give you the script of your life, right? How you're gonna think and how you're gonna act, you're gonna be successful, not successful, smart, not smart, right? The more we, the, and, and, and if it's psychology or, or in, these are, in, 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 these are scientific, scientific ideas that today they were already, we're already based on the, on, the, on the scores in school, this is who you're gonna be at, and, and based on all that stuff, it kind of, Puts us also, we, we get trapped, say, this is who I'm going to be, the, 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 the idea of a determinism. So look at text 14 by Rabbi Sachs. Because again, how does then, if, if, if I have a certain gene, and this is who I'm going to be, and this is going to think, and this is how I'm going to act, then how, so how do we have, where does the idea of freedom of choice come in? So we're moving away from astrology for a moment here, right? We're going from, in the other, quote unquote, determinism. Because what is astrology by, by definition? Determinism. And we said, okay, I have a whole lesson from the rabbi that even though it could be determined, I'm strong into that, I can above that. But how about my own genes? How about my own psychological makeup? So text 14, he writes as follows. Free will is one of the fundamental beliefs of Judaism. My mind explains why. If we had no free will, there would be, as he says, no point to the commands, the mitzvot, and the prohibitions since we will behave as we were predestined to, regardless of what the law is. Nor would there be any justice in rewards or punishment, since neither the righteous nor the wrongdoer is free to be the other than what they are. So the problem is an ancient one, but it has become much more salient than in modern times because of the sheer accumulation of chances to the belief in human freedom. Marx said, history is formed by the play of economics forces. Freud argued that we are what we are because of unconscious thrives. Neo-Darwinism says that whoever we rationalize our behavior, we do what we do because people who behave this way in the past survive to hand on their genes to future generations. Most recently, neuroscientists have shown using MRI scans that in some cases our brain registers a decision up to seven seconds before we are consciously aware of it, right? So how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we, um, how do we kind of respond to this? This, this really, uh, and, and by the way, we all trap in that because we all have already our own definition of this is who I am, I can be changed, you know. So I want to finish, conclude with the Hasidic perspective of this. And Best we're going to read this directly in the last text for today, text 15. And we'll go back to what you said, Linda, about creating, we created in God's image. Let's read this first, and then we'll take that apart. Text 15, page 74. 
Hasidic elders related that when Rabbi Shnezaman of the Yadi, who is the author of the Tanya, first Chabad Rebbe, returned from his studies with Rabbi Dov Ber, the Magi of Mizrich, he expounded on the passage, know that which is above you. He interpreted it to mean, know that that which is above depends on you. It's a beautiful saying. So we say it's in the ethics of Father, right? Know what's above you. What does that mean? Simple. Remember, God's always above you, right? Always watching. Right? One reason we wear a keeper, our men wear a keeper, they have to be reminded that God is above, above you, right? Um, but here, the Hasidic interpretation is know that that which is above depends on you. The spiritual world's way to hear a Jew discussing matters of Torah. So we always are wired to think that what? That our life is kind of guided by higher heavenly bodies, or in Kabbalah, by higher spiritual worlds, right? Based on those energy, it affects me. But here, Hasidic teaching comes out the opposite. You are the ones that's doing the signals, not they. So not just that we can surpass, that we can over, overcome them or surpass them, but the angels of heaven are waiting to hear us answer Baruch Hu or Kedusha, or we say Amen. When you in the synagogue here at Kaddish and you say Amen, the angels of, of heaven, they are waiting for that because that gives them, that gives them the, their own energy and their blessing. We are feeding them, they are not feeding us. The earth that we step on has been waiting since creation for someone to walk on it and recite a chapter of Psalms or discuss a Torah matter with a colleague. So a very powerful idea that is not that we need to use these mitzvahs and prayers to break some type of decree. No, 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 no. You don't have to, create, you don't, you don't have to break anything. You're actually creating it. You are the one that's creating it. You have the power to create it. If you don't, if you say no, they are the ones that give, is, uh, determine my outcome, then you are basically, you are packing yourself into that, in those energy. You, you are, you're putting yourself hostage in those energies. We give them energy. On the contrary, we give them energy, or, or by very definition, like we said in the beginning of this class, beginning of the course, right? We are, we are not, we don't, we're not the, our destiny is not be determined. We create our own destiny. It's a power of you. Why? Because you are created in God's image. And that's the power that you have. So you think something, think, oh, it's a chapter of Psalms, a amen, or a blessing, what is it, a prayer, or a mitzvah, what does it even have an effect? You're affecting everything. You're affecting not just you, affecting everything around you, in the entire universe. So when you say a prayer, it has an effect of the soldier sitting in Gaza as an effect for somebody who's very sick, make a mishaberach. So that will lead us to next week, or two weeks, <laughs> to the next idea, do curses, evil eye, do they have power over us? You all know already the answer, right? What is the answer? No. Well, huh? Well, in a, well, it depends. If you pay attention to it, then you get sucked into that energy. But if you don't pay attention to it, all right, so I don't have to give the class. Happy Pesach. No. So let's just watch the, um, I want to, I'm going to send this in a video because I, I didn't know, in the video, it's late. There's a, um, a very famous um, psychologist and, 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 and uh, sorry, nurse, a neuro, neuroscientist. And he, in, two, in the 2005 or so, it's a famous story, but I, I'll, it's best to hear it from him directly. He was uh, seeing that when he does brain uh, MRIs on people's brain, he can really determine what type of people they are based on their brains and what. And uh, so he would decide he's going to research his own family. So he had a file in his office that had numbers, didn't have say who. And he, because he didn't want to like, you know, say krich, you know, it's, it's confidential. So he, this is the numbers and he started looking. He, one scan he looked at and said, wow, this, this person is a psychopath. This is very dangerous. He did actually, he analyzed murderers and rapists in jail. And he says, this is exactly the same brain idea. And one of his family members, he was shocked. He was shocked. And, uh, and he couldn't hold himself in, so he decided he's going to, he has to decide who this is, going to help that person. Well, who would it be? It must be, he said, it must be a mistake. 
He went back to his uh, assistant and says, this file, this number is not for my family. It must be one of the jails that we did. That's, and sure enough, it turned out, so whose brain was it? It was his own brain. It was his own brain. And he, and he says, this is his own brain. And he says, now I understand why when I go to a party, I would have been very aggressive. I had those tendencies. But the power is that even if you're wired like this, right? He wasn't a murder rapist. You have the power within you to overcome that. All right. All right. We're going to stop over here. Thank you very much. Remember again, uh, not, not next week. We're going to continue April 9th. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.